Peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to the sixth season of Guerrilla Christianity. My name is Pastor Brett Walker, and I want to thank you for listening to Guerrilla Christianity, an unconventional, no apologies exposition of God's Holy Word. And right now we want to get right into God's Word, so let's go. Now please take out your Bibles, either the ones that you brought with you or the ones in the pews, and turn in them with me to the book of John. We're on chapter 2 of John. We're sort of taking a departure from Luke. Luke is our uh, lectionary reading for the year, but this week we are going to look at the first of Jesus' miracles. We're in a series right now which is about the firsts of Jesus' ministry. Last week we looked at the first step, which was his baptism. And this week we're going to look at the very first miracle that he performed after that baptism, which was this, the turning of water into wine. It's a familiar story. We all pretty much know it. Um, But we're going to look at some things today that I hope will uh, enlighten us and help us to see that these are the first of the signs. This is the first of the signs that points to Jesus' glory as the Son of God. So let us hear the word of the Lord for us this morning. It's found on page 93 if you're following in the Pew Bible. And it is chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, What concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O Lord, we are looking for signs and wonders to guide us into belief in your Son, Jesus Christ. Open our eyes that we may see the signs that point to his glory, that we may believe in him and trust in his love and grace for our salvation. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you have ever gone to the DMV? Yeah, that's an exciting time. Um, To get your license renewed, you need to have several pieces of identification. They call it six points of identification that you need to have. As you all know that Erin is traveling this week. She has flown out to Washington State. And... In order to get on a plane, you need an ID, a photo ID that shows that you are who the ticket says you are, right? Well, horror of horrors, somewhere between here and there, she lost her license. So (laughs) she's freaking out. And then she says, well, can you go to the DMV and get a copy because she has a digital license? And I called the DMV and they said, no, 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 no. No, no, no. She has to come and get it. And I said, what's she supposed to do? Hitchhike back here? You know, I mean, she's got a a two-year-old in tow. And they said, well, um, you know, uh, if there is some other way that she can get on a plane and come back, she says, they said, otherwise, 
in order to get the license from out of state, it takes two to three weeks for the paperwork. And I'm going, oh my gosh, this is a nightmare, you know? Ultimately, what we did was uh, I mailed her her uh, passport, um, which that was kind of nerve-wracking, too, because you're putting it in the mail, and it's out of your hands for like 24 hours. But she got it, and everything should be okay. When she returns, then she will get her license again. But the DMV is very particular about making sure that you are who you are. The TSA, also at the airport, making sure that you have the proper credentials that prove that you are who you are. This is what Jesus is doing here. He's showing to his disciples and to us the proper credentials that say he is who he says he is. That he's not just some guy wandering around claiming to be the son of God, but that is exactly who he is. And how does he prove that? He doesn't have a special you know, digital photo ID from heaven that says Jesus Christ on it, you know. It, but what he has are the miracles that he shows. Now, nowhere else in the Bible, there are other people who perform miracles in the Bible, but no one else in the Bible does it say of them when they perform the miracles that it was to show their glory, but it was always to show the glory of God. And what we see in today's reading is in this last verse, verse 11, it says, Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory. When Moses performed signs for Pharaoh, it didn't say he did those things to reveal the glory of Moses, but that he did it to show the strong arm of God. God did those miracles through Moses, to show who God was to Pharaoh, who was a believer in many gods. And God was saying, all those gods that you worship are not gods. They're just stone idols. I am God. Your idols can't do these things that I'm doing. So they were to perform or to proclaim the glory of God. Only here, only in John's gospel does it say that the reason for Jesus miracles was to reveal the glory of Jesus and I find that very important I find that very interesting in the context of this story occurs a few days after Jesus baptism and the calling of the disciples now after he was baptized he returned to Galilee and he called his first disciples we read in the first chapter of John that he called first Andrew and Philip And then Andrew went and got his brother, Simon, who we later call Peter. And Philip went and got his friend, Nathaniel. Now, Nathaniel, by the way, is very important to this story because Nathaniel is from Cana of Galilee. It's entirely possible he's either related to the bridegroom or he may have been the bridegroom himself. We don't know. They don't, they don't name the bridegroom or the family of the, of the wedding party. But we are reminded in verses 50 and 51 of chapter 1 that Jesus will perform greater signs. Remember when Nathaniel came, he said, I knew you when you were sitting under your fig tree. I saw you. And Nathaniel was taken aback, and he said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. And Jesus said, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he told them, he, told, he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man bringing up that image of Jacob's ladder, Jacob's dream, where he saw a ladder into heaven and the angels of God ascending and descending into heaven and from heaven on this ladder. Jesus is saying, I am that ladder. Later on, he tells Thomas and his disciples, I am the way. 
and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. He is the ladder. He is the way. So here we come to this wedding in Cana. Jesus, we are told, by the way, by uh, John Wesley, that he does not turn away from society, but he embraces it fully. In other words, here he is in the midst of a celebration, a wedding, a wedding feast. And it's interesting because in the reading in Isaiah that we read today, describes a wedding feast. It says, you will be called Beulah. We don't see that word in the NRSV, but we see it in other translations, particularly in the King James. Your land will be called Beulah, which means married. Maybe you know the C.S. or the C. Austin Miles hymn, Dwelling in Beulah Land. It's where it comes from. So on the third day, there was a wedding, Cana of Galilee. The mother of Jesus was there. I find it interesting, too. In John's Gospel, Mary is never named. She's always called the mother of Jesus. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding, indicating that they knew the wedding party, right? When the wine gave out. Now, understand these weddings... These wedding banquets and these wedding parties, they're not like the wedding parties that we go to. We go to a reception after the wedding and it lasts for a few hours and there's great revelry and everything else, but we're talking about a celebration that lasts for days, even maybe a week in, in many cases. And people would go home and sleep and wake up the next day and join the celebration again. The wine gave out. It's not hard to imagine in a large wedding party that everybody would drink up all the wine. But when the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Now there's a couple of things that are speculated here. Either she's telling him, you know, you know, Jesus, you can, you can make some wine. I know you can. They have no wine, right? Or... She may have been saying to him, listen, they have no wine. You're kind of a big deal. If you leave, maybe the others will leave as well. Because now is the time. You know, it's time to play my way on the, on, the, on the old jukebox, and that tells everybody it's time to go home. Right? Well, Jesus replies to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. John uses the word, the hour, to refer to the time of his death and his crucifixion. Jesus is saying, my hour has not yet come. It's not yet time for me to be revealed. And yet he does what his mother asks him. And I think she knows that he's going to do it because then she says to the servants, do Whatever he tells you. You know, no matter how crazy, do whatever he tells you. Now, this is what Jesus does. He tells the servants, there are some sewn water jars. They each hold about 20 or 30 gallons of water. For the rites of purification. Now, understand that in the book of Leviticus, there are many laws which prescribe ritual purification and washing but every single one of them applies only to the priests. It has nothing to do with the common people, the minharets, the people of the land. They, they don't have to do these rites of purification. So why are these stone jars there? They're not, for, they're not there for, um, for uh, hygienic purposes. They're not there so that people could clean themselves. They're for ritual purification, we're told. And it's because of the oral tradition. From the book of Leviticus, from the Torah, through the period of about 1,500 years, there has been this oral tradition which developed through the rabbis. 
and they began to interpret the Torah in different ways. And so there was a tradition that was handed down, and so they were told, the people were told that before you can eat anything, and we find this in Mark 2, in chapter 7, before you can eat anything, you have to wash yourself to make sure that you are not contaminated by any of the cooties that you can get from the Gentiles. Okay? Basically what they were saying. You have to make sure you are ritually pure because we have to buy this stuff at the marketplace and anything that's bought at the marketplace, we have to come home and wash ourselves lest we defile ourselves by what we eat. Lest we contaminate the food that we are eating and become revulsion in God's eyes. But those laws were not for the common people. They were for the priests, because the priests have to be ritually pure in order to do the acts of sacrifice and the things that they are prescribed to do in the worship of God. So here's these six stone jars for ritual purification that stand in stark contrast to the law that God gave it, gave down. This is from the man, the oral tradition of man. And this is the problem with religion a lot of times. And religion is a set of man-made rules that tell us how we can get good with God. But God is all about what He does to bring us to Himself freely. So this is the first sign, and he's using these stone jars. And I don't think that's by mistake. He says, fill them up with water. Notice he doesn't do the filling. He doesn't want to make, he wants to make sure that there is no, this is like a magician with a trick, you know. Here, you take the cards. You pull the card out yourself. You show it to the audience. You put the card back in. You take the deck and put it in my sock, you know, or whatever they do, you know to prove that they are not handling the thing. So this is what Jesus is doing. He says to the servants, you fill the jars with water. They fill them up with water. Okay? Talking about 180 gallons of water at this point. Then he said to them, draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So this is water that is in these vessels that people have been washing their hands in. Would you be drinking? If, let's say, for example, if I were to fill up a, a bathroom sink and say, here, take a, take a glass of water out of that and drink it, would you? It's kind of gross, right? They take the water to the steward and he tastes the water. The water had become wine. He didn't know where the, where the wine came from. The servants knew. He calls the bridegroom over. And he says, most people will serve the good wine at first. And then after everybody's drunk and their taste buds are dulled, they give them the the cheap wine. But you have saved the best wine for now. This water that was in these stone pots for purification, the people have been washing their hands in, have been turned into not just any wine, but the, the best wine. And there's a, there's a lesson here, too. Jesus used the vessels that were for ritual purification, a burden of the law, into wine for celebration. We see in... Chapter 1 and verse 17, it says that the law indeed was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. He took something that came from the law of Moses and turned it into grace and beauty. Wine represents eternal life in God's kingdom. In Isaiah chapter 25, 
verses 6 through 9, we read, The Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain, a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces with marrow, and refined aged wine. And on this mountain he will swallow up the covering which is over all peoples, even the veil which is stretched over all nations. He will swallow up death for all time. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And he will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken, and it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God for whom we have waited that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. That's what Jesus was doing. He was proclaiming that this is what he was coming to. The purpose of this sign, we are told in verse 11, is to manifest his glory. It says that his disciples believed in him. That's the translation in the NRSV. The Greek word is they believed into him. They believed into him. It means they put their whole trust in him. After seeing this sign, this was the first of the miracles that he performed after the baptism, and now they were already following him, and now they say, well, this guy's the real deal. And they believe into him. We read in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, He says, therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. John only recorded seven miracles that Jesus performed in chapters 2 through 12. He says, they're not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. These miracles are recorded for our benefit so that we may believe. Because when we read the Gospels, all of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are so many miracles that Jesus performs, more than just the seven that John recorded, but every single one of them points to the glory of Jesus. They manifest His glory, His authority. They are a sign that He is who He says He is. They're a sign of his identity. When Jesus says, I am the son of God, anybody can just walk down the street and say, I'm the son of God. But without performing miracles, actual miracles, and not just a magician's trick or an illusion, but an actual miracle. This is a miracle. The Molecular makeup of water and wine is so completely different that the elements required for wine don't even exist in water. It's missing a lot of the elements in order to become wine. And it wasn't just a trick, it wasn't just changing the color of the water, but the chief steward said, this is the best wine I've ever tasted. Perfectly aged, just as Isaiah said, well aged wine. What signs have we seen that point to the glory of Jesus? What is it that we have seen that causes us to believe into Jesus, to put our whole trust in Him, our Lord and our Savior? When God performs signs and wonders in our midst, it is done so that we may believe, and in believing, have life. In his name, the name of Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. What was it that caused you to believe in Jesus? What brings you to this place week after week? Or what brought you out on this Sunday morning? You could have slept in or you could have been at home making preparations for the playoff games this afternoon. Instead, you came here to worship God and to praise him for all that he has done. Let us rejoice that God has given us signs and wonders that point to the divinity of Christ, that the burden of the law has given away to the celebration of the wedding. We, the church, are the bride of Christ, and he is the bridegroom. 
And he provides the most excellent wine at the end of the banquet. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you are our mighty God, our sweet salvation, the giver of abundant life. We thank you this morning and give you unending praise for the signs and wonders you have performed. Not just in the midst of the people of Cana of Galilee, but among us today. We thank you for the people you have put in our lives that pointed the way to your glory. We thank you that you have revealed yourself to us in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. We praise you and give to you our whole lives, just as you gave your life for us on the cross. All power, might, majesty, and glory be to you, our God and King. Amen. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Guerrilla Christianity. My hope and prayer is that this time of listening to and learning from God's Word has blessed you as much as it has blessed me putting this message together. Now, I have been blessed that God has called me to minister to two churches in rural New Jersey, Ebenezer United Methodist Church in Auburn and Hudson United Methodist Church in Pettertown. And if you don't have a church family to call your own, I'd like to invite you to join us on Sunday mornings. We are a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching, Christ-adoring faith community in the heart of New Jersey's farmland. But if you don't live nearby, get involved with the church where you are. We are not called to be Christians in isolation, but in community. So I would encourage you to live out your faith with a group of like-minded believers where you are. Again, I pray that you have been blessed by this teaching, and I hope that you will join us again next time. God bless you and keep you. Amen. Amen.